The European Commission says the continent's moving too slowly in getting more women into the top jobs. But as the Commission suggests legislation, are quotas the best way to help women make it up the career ladder? And how will it impact on businesses? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, the European Commission is thinking about passing laws now to force companies to hire specific quotas of women on their boards. Well, the Commission says businesses have failed to make sufficient progress in gender equality over the past year. Justice Commissioner Viviane Redding says at the current rate, it would take more than 40 years for women to hold 40% of board positions in Europe's publicly traded companies. So let's take a closer look at how things stand worldwide then. Well, in the West, about 30% of senior positions are held by women. That's almost double the figure in Asia, where women hold only 13% of the top jobs. But does this mean quotas actually work? Well, in countries that already have introduced quotas, 30 to 40% of senior positions are filled by women. In Belgium and Italy, for example, it's 33% at the top. In Spain, 32%. And in France, almost 40% of senior positions are allocated to women. Well, by comparison, countries that don't have compulsory quotas swing between both ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, you have countries like Germany. Almost 40% of senior positions are held by women there. But on the other hand, in Pakistan, only 3% of women have high-level jobs. So, are quotas the best way to help women make it up that career ladder? Well, to answer the question, we're joined by our guests. In London, Joe Sawicki, a non-executive director at the French biotech company Isocell. Joe is also the CEO of Ceres, which conducts training for board members. In New York, Ranjana Kumari, director of the Centre for Social Research and a women's rights activist. And also in London, Patricia Rochford, director of the consulting company Rochford International. She's also an executive search consultant and has put many women on the board. Thanks uh, for all of you for joining us. Let's start with Patricia. If the European Commission does legislate compulsory quotas, will that make your job more difficult? I think it makes it a very different job for most search consultants because there aren't so many women who, under the present way people looking at make, making appointments, who fit the categories. So what so happens then? Do you, do you bring the categories? This is very interesting. Do you bring the categories down? Tell us from a, a purely technical, no, analytical process. How do you fill the board position when they've got to be women then? When I've had to do this, when clients have come to me and said, we need a woman, we are looking and, you know, so this is the appointment we need to make for our board balance. We have to redefine what the background might be because so often with men it's been someone who's been the chief executive or the finance director. With the woman they often have a quite a different background, a different career background. So we're looking for the skills of listening, um, ability to assimilate data, ability to relate to um, be independent in thought, but also to work with a group, to think at that level, to understand how an organisation works. And a lot of these women are, are not so visible. So for a search consultant, you have to do a lot more work. You have to do a lot more research. You have to do a lot more checking. Um, you have to do a lot right, more Right, but at the same sourcing. time, do you, think, do you think most companies actually come to uh, search consultants like you to seek out the right talent? Or do they simply, you know, look at the women that they already have in their uh, ranks and try and promote them just to fill the number quickly and, and not, uh, you know, break the quota? I would hope that they look at the women in their ranks to see if they could come through as an executive director, but not too quickly. And, and the normal thing if you're making an appointment of a chief executive is you look within your ranks as well as outside. And I would hope that that's what would happen with this. All right. That if there is a quota... Let's, let's, if I could jump in here, let's bring in... looking outside. Let's bring in Joe Sawicki. Uh, Joe, you heard there right. what Patricia's saying. She hopes companies would actually do the search properly. Um, you've been a CEO of a, a publicly listed company. Tell us what you've experienced in reality. 
Well, I wasn't prepared at all for taking on the role. I was an entrepreneur who founded the company and I ended up floating it on the stock exchange. So by default, I became a, a director of a listed company. But when you're an entrepreneur and you run your own company, then suddenly you've gone to a listed status it's completely different kettle of fish and the people you're dealing with at board level have come from different backgrounds, um, from different industries and they have different expectations and it was a, a real shock for me uh, turning up at, to my first board meeting and being really not prepared in any way shape or form for what I had to do. So with that in mind um, do you think quotas I, are a I, good <laughs> idea then? Do you think quotas would I, I focus? I don't think quotas are a good idea. Why not? I, I feel that quotas, I, I believe there should be quality not quantity. I, I very very much believe in the empowerment of women but the problem is if you have a majority on the board and they become a silent majority that could be the worst thing that ever happens to women. Um, I've had horror stories from friends of mine who sit on boards in Norway because Norway has a, a very high um, uh, legislation to have women on boards and a, a number of these women um, were suddenly put onto boards and they weren't well prepared for it and they found that all the big decisions were being made behind the boardroom doors before the boardroom happened um, and they were left out of the decision making process because they weren't considered to be of equal strength and and I would hate that to happen um, right, as that, a result that's of the a really process. interesting point and experience you're sharing there let's take that to Ranjana I understand Ranjana you've been campaigning and you think quotas are a good thing but do they lead to quantity before quality as Joe is pointing out well, I think this has been old debate that if you bring women through quota and quotas are the only way to create gender balance in whichever policy making decision making body, because, you know, it is in 1995 in Beijing that it was identified that only 10 percent women are there. And it has taken so long, almost going to be 20 years before uh, this kind of a decision is going to be taken by European Union. And we really welcome it because quality comes only through learning and experience experience and women even when they have the experience and they know uh, have they have the know-how to be on the board they have never been given that opportunity because uh, as you heard from Patricia that you know the environment that women are not considered competent enough to take decision now this is very uh, you know this has been the perception and the women who have joined the boards have been able to take decisions whether it is the corporate sector industry whether it is in the governance systems whether it is in the university boards. Has I think that education, been your experience, wherever you look Ranjana, at when women have got the opportunity, actually, they have managed to perform. Has that actually been your experience though? Sorry? Have women been able to exercise real power or have they been the silent majority as, as Jo was, was sharing an experience that she's seen where they may be there in the boardroom but they're not pulling well, the strings of power? Well, I think, uh, you know, looking at Indian women when they perform, whether it is Indira Nui, whether it is, you know, you, you go down the, whether it is Ranjana Kumari, the same name as mine, who really turned the whole bank around, the Indian bank. If you look at the president of India as a woman, all the opposition party leaders are women. There are in the, in the industry now, slowly the awareness is growing and there is much more desire of the corporations and, uh, and industry to get more women on the board. So I think it's really seeing the commitment, the performance, the intellect, the ability to take tough decisions or to take good decisions, balanced decisions. I think women have performed. Uh, you can see across the board uh, in the corporates that women are able to do that. But only because the perception is that women will be uh, will not be able to perform well, they have not been getting that opportunity. And I don't think uh, in, in absence of opportunity, you can right. bring women up and you can give women the ch chances and the choices to be on the board and perform. How many board really have how many percent of women so I think unless women are there how do you really prejudge okay. that they will not be able to perform all right let's um, we'll come to some of those points you've raised there but if I can go to Patricia once again in London and ask you the question when you're out there hiring and looking for female recruits have you noticed whether sort of women recruits invest more or less in themselves if there's a compulsory quota what sort of effect does it have does it make women think well now that I know I have a chance let me invest more in myself or does it make women think the opposite that now that I know I've got a secure career path to the top I don't need to to invest so much effort look it's both believe it or not there are some people who whenever there's a quota 
or there's a commitment to bring women through, think, right, as long as I'm in the right place, I'll get there because they need me. Um, and then there are others who actually think, well, if there is a quota, and I'm not sure philosophically whether I'm in favour of quotas, so that's another matter. But I think when they know that there is a chance that people will put them on boards or that boards are really looking and prepared to consider a woman, I think there is a lot of thought given to it. And women tend to prepare much more carefully for anything than, than men do in an equivalent position. I think one of the things about women going on boards and being, to use Joe's expression, the silent part of the board, I think there is a difference. It's interesting over the years when I put women on boards and then I've been doing references before I put them on perhaps a second or third board. And men will often say to me, oh, but, you know, she doesn't say anything or she doesn't contribute. And when I actually check, I find the same story from a lot of women, that they make a contribution, but because they speak a slightly different language, they're not heard at first. And I find you need a chairman and and or a deputy chairman, but at least a chairman or the senior independent director, who you need someone there who's prepared to mentor women when they first come on boards to make sure that when they do speak, they're listened to, that they are treated with respect and they are treated as an equal. And I think that helps overcome some of those difficulties of just coming from a different way of expressing yourself, a different way of seeing a situation or an option or a problem, um, and of address and, okay. and being heard. Let's go to Joe then. Joe, you work with uh, board members, you train board members. Mm -hmm. Do you think that imposing mandatory uh, quotas kind of deflects attention away from the importance of training, of training women, of mentoring them into these positions, and the focus just becomes on numbers and number crunching? I, a lot of companies that I work with, or with are some of the big four financial companies, for example, and they take um, uh, their diversity policies very, very seriously, and they do have aims internally of getting, um, you know, 30 to 40 percent of women on their boards, but they go through very, very, very rigorous training programs beforehand, and it's the men as well as the women who are being trained, because if you've been on a, an all-male board um, and suddenly a woman joins the board, we have different ways of expressing ourselves, different ways of communicating and the men on the board need to understand about the different communication styles. I mean, sometimes I have two men on a board who have very different communication styles and they have issues with that. So it's not just about male, female. It's also it, different individuals have different styles and traditionally the more forceful individuals get their views heard and then the, the more subtle people tend to try and place their ideas and if it's not being heard, they, they, they retreat. So how would you respond um, then, Joe, so to perhaps the point which uh, Ranjana raised here which is that if we don't have quotas in the first place and try and uh, give women a chance to get into that environment and get into that process and that dynamic of interacting and learning with each other women are not going to move up anyway it might not be perfect at the beginning but give it some time it'll work she might say what, what I'm worried about is I think a year isn't a very long time. So let's put this in perspective. The European Commission has said, we've given you a year and there's not much progress. Um, if I was a bit, some of the big companies I'm working with, they're taking this seriously, but they're getting people ready. They're getting the men on the boards ready and they're getting the women on the boards ready. And they're realizing it's a process of integration. If you suddenly flood the boards with women who aren't at the right caliber, you will then potentially get a ba backlash. I think we have to look at a phased process and right. and go for the quality again and, and, and say this is our aim, this is what we want, and then bring everyone up along right. with I, it. I can see I, Ranjana I, I is shaking her head in disagreement, <laughs> so I'm going to try and bring her in here. Yes, I think it's very wrong presumption that, you know, there are women are not available. You just heard the search company, uh, Patricia, said that, you know, we haven't got as many women. We have to work harder to search such, search such women. I think there are women who are now available, trained, with if it is equal training, equal qualification, with equal, uh, you know, tr experience. But because of the uh, notion and the perception and also the belief of the uh, company systems where they don't think women are equally competent, 
incompetent. They don't uh, they don't hire and recruit these women. So there is a gender bias in recruitment policy, and that is responsible for keeping all these very competent women who are available but who are not known outside right. the uh, circuit. So if they are brought in, then the, what is the how how is the difference uh, if the same training woman comes in? Why can't the women? They are arguing for it, and they can put their point as forcefully as possible. Okay. What makes you feel that women will not be able to do okay. that? You can you can entrust a whole nation as head of as a woman head. Why can't you entrust a company as right, a woman right. head or, okay. or at least equal I'm, in Ranjana, the board? I'm going to jump in I here mean, if I can. Yeah, and I want to bring in Patricia for a final uh, comment on a point before we'll have to thank her. Um, we've seen countries, Patricia, in which they have mandatory quotas: Spain, France, Iceland, Netherlands. I think they just legislated board quotas in 2010, but compliance has still been weak. Why? Well, you know what, I was just listening then and I was just thinking, I remember a chairman uh, who was saying to me, he was making an appointment and who was going out to a search. And I said, now you have specified, you, it wasn't working with me, just a friend. And I said, you have specified a woman. He said, oh no, the way we specified it, I doubt we will get a woman. And I said, well, why did you specify it that way? And we went on talking and he, what came out was he said, you know, if I meet a man, an interview a man, I can tell how he'll behave on a board. If I meet a woman, I'm not so sure. I'm uncomfortable. Oh, so we need a bit and, of you know, gender I'm education against, I'm against communication quotas. then. <laughs> I'm against quotas, but I think one of the reasons it doesn't meet is men don't, who are often making the decisions and the key people making the decisions, don't know how to assess the ability and the potential behaviour and contribution of a woman on the board because they've never really worked with women in that sense as equals. Right. And I right. think there is this barrier still. All right. Patricia Rochford, director of the consulting company Rochford International, it's good to have you with us. Let's talk a little bit now about employment quotas for women in the workplace and how they sometimes prove controversial. So let's take a look at the arguments for and against the use of quotas. Supporters of quotas say they don't discriminate against men but do compensate for barriers that already exist for women. They also argue that once some women are appointed, they serve as role models for others. Supporters see quotas as the most effective way of achieving that gender balance in the workplace. All right, let's welcome uh, into this discussion now, joining us from London, Hosan Mahmoud. She's a women's rights activist and blogger. If I could uh, pose a question to you, Hosan, you've worked at the grassroots level on uh, campaigns around the world, but particularly also in Iraq. Iraq is one country where you do have a quota for women in, in some areas, like in Parliament. Does that help the empowerment of women in other areas? Does it provide a role model for women? Yes, well, um, there is, uh, that's true, there are quotas for women in the Iraqi parliament, but actually um, they have been there for a while and actually there's no improvement on the grassroots levels and that I am not totally opposed to the um, quota system and that to the women's participation in politics and representation in parliament or other institutions, but the fact is having elitist women and having women in uh, high positions and uh, and decision making doesn't necessarily mean that they can represent grassroots women and that actually it will empower Why? Why doesn't uh, the women on the ground. Hazan? Why doesn't it offer that great role because model for other women to aspire to? Because having only 25% of uh, seats in parliament doesn't mean that millions of women uh, who have been suffering because of war, who have been widowed, or uh, they have been trafficked out of the country, they have to enter the prostitution industry and, and uh, you know, to, to provide um, you know, a meal for their children because of poverty, because of inequality, because of lack of jobs, and because of uh, lack of security in that country. That is the problem. Uh, having women in parliament and in politics is okay, is a good thing. I want women to be in all uh, public and, and uh, basically economic and political spheres, but uh, that doesn't mean that the situation of women altogether will change. Right. We have to actually tackle the roots and the causes of, of the problems, inequalities right. and uh, suppression of women. I want to take this question as well to Joe Swicky, because I know you've worked on this issue in many countries too, Joe. And have you, yes. would you agree with that? Do you find that perhaps the whole question of 
of talking about the number of women simply in, in top jobs is the wrong way to look at women empowerment. I, I totally um, believe that's the wrong way to look at it. When I was working in Saudi Arabia with the first two women who joined the Chamber of Commerce in Jeddah, and when I work with women here on PLC boards, I'm dealing with exactly the same issues. It's no different. I, I really? Have How is that? One would imagine there is quite a gulf between I the know. two. Oh, no, not at all. And, and that's the interesting. And sometimes for fun, when these people travel as they do, I get them all together and say, guys, you have the same issues. It's not that different. And I, I, they may be more extreme to some of the women for in, in the Gulf, but it, they're, they're pretty much the same issues, just on maybe not quite as big a scale. And, and the whole thing is that women are our, are our own worst um, critics. So as Patricia said earlier, we will always try and train and be better at something. And very often it's, it's an issue of confidence about what believing in ourselves right. and believing that our voice matters. And, and just as the, um, the person who's just joined us said, you know, it's a root level thing. It's a thing to do with how we're brought up in society. And it's not that, I promise you, it's not that much different to the West as it is into the, into All right, the developing countries. Let's take some of those points the, now to Ranjana. Countries. I think I have a suspicion she might have a different perspective on this. You, of course, do work at all levels as well. So, I mean, does it pay off to focus on quotas for women at the top jobs? Or are you ignoring the grassroots? Well, I think the quotas uh, do, I mean, they, uh, two things. One, that it creates the level playing field and also it creates the conditions for equality uh, where you do have opportunity and also an access to any kind of board, any kind of, you know, even in parliament. Uh, just the sister from Iraq said that this, the quota is there, but uh, it, is, it is not really changing the lives of the women at the grassroots. I think it is to some extent true, but this is very recent change in Iraq that uh, the quota has been in, introduced. In India, the, 50% women in many states and also 33% women in uh, majority of the states are go getting elected in the local bodies and these seats have been reserved. That means there is a quota, there is a reserved seat for women, only women can contest women and that is really bringing a huge amount of transformation at the local level because women then can sit down in the uh, uh, panchayat level which is the local bodies and make right. decisions about roads, school, hospital and many other things and that is really reaching out okay. to millions of women All and right. their so lives are getting a, transformed. We've just so got a, a minute left on, on this show. Let me try and get a final uh, yes. uh, thought in from uh, Hosanne if we could. So uh, how do you balance that I guess is my question Hosanne. Um, it seems like there are different priorities for different women in different cultural situations. Is it a one-size-fits-all campaign that can really work here? I think you cannot apply one theory to the entire, to the rest of the world. I mean, different societies have different contexts. Uh, I mean, different places have been hit by wars and occupations and sanctions and others uh, have had a long history of women's movements and struggles. But in general, generally speaking, misogyny, religiosity, inequality, poverty, uh, you know, uh, violence against women, sexism, ageism, all of this exists all around the world, in my opinion. I mean, uh, having more women in UK Parliament or Europe European parliaments uh, doesn't mean that there is no violence against women and there is no rape of, of, of women when they go out in the night. I mean, it's important to look, I mean, as I said, I'm not opposed to the quota as per se, but I am actually as a grassroots level um, activist, I am for the empowerment of women generally, uh, you know, to fight for their rights, for equalities, for freedoms and for personal freedoms above all. Because if you have, for example, in Iraq, we have a so-called woman minister and she just recently passed a very misogynist uh, you know, um, declaration whereby she wants every woman to be veiled and to be covered. I mean, this would be as bad as a male minister who is who does it really. So the question is not how many women do we have in seats and parliaments and upper positions. The question is what can they offer to the society as a whole, not only to right. the women. Uh, so the question here is really right. it is important for the women, regardless of of their race and uh, a class question and we've understood background, to be equally very well. represented. Thank you very much for making that point. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we're going to have to thank all of our guests, Joe Sawicki, Ranjana Kumari, and, of course, Hussain Mahmoud. And thank you very much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. As always, if you want to send us your feedback, you know where to send it. Email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching.